Hvor den er lige her, hvor der stadigvæk er nødt til. A huge welcome to today's science talk. It is 3 p.m. Thursday the 27th of August and it is our very first science talk after the summer holidays with what we find a very, 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 very uh, relevant topic, Corona City. And it is a huge pleasure to say thank you to Ole. Ole B. Jensen, professor at Aalborg University Center for Mobility and Urban Studies, mm -hmm. uh, who has studied extensively in mobility, in urban planning, and also in how we behave when it comes to our interactions in the city, be it through transportation or just us. We will touch upon some really, really interesting topics. You will find me later for those of you who have joined us from near and afar. You will find me in a moment in the chat on YouTube and you're more than welcome to ask questions. But for those of you who are watching from Holland, Germany, elsewhere abroad, it is such a pleasure to welcome you and we're hugely excited that you're here. I would also like to welcome our partners from BlocksUp who are enabling that we're able to run this wonderful series of what is happening around the world since we have experienced the pandemic crisis. Some of you are here today, some of you are watching from Norway. Thank you to Doka, to DTC, to Giel. It is such a pleasure to collaborate with you guys. Not least, though, thank you all for coming. Uh, I have been looking forward to this throughout my summer holidays, but I've also been thinking, because we talked before the summer, that things can change. We didn't know what COVID-19 would bring us, and all of a sudden, during the summer holidays, things erupted again worldwide and also in Denmark. We didn't publish it before today, but we will publish an interview that I have had with Ole after the science talks where I'm actually asking, so what about what's going on right now? But for now, without further ado, huge welcome to you, Ole, and thank you again. Thank you so much, Penille. Um, and uh, thank you. First of all, uh, I want to thank the organizers for the Blocks Hop Science Talks for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, secondly, I should mention that the presentation is based on a paper titled Epidemic Disruption, Extended Bodies and Elastic Situations, Reflections on the Post-COVID-19 Mobilities, which is submitted for a special issue of the Journal Mobilities on COVID-19. Also, I will be drawing on work that I've been doing together with my colleague uh, Nikolai Schulz on a book that is um, to be published at Hans Reisel in Danish, uh, The Epidemiske Samfund, uh, The Epidemic Society. So those will be kind of the background um, ideas. Um, after the opening introduction, I shall discuss a few concepts enabling us to make more sense of COVID-19. Um, one being the notion of the extended body and the other the notion of the elastic situation. In section four, I will apply these concepts to three short um, empirical cases of transformation in interaction in public space. The, fa the, the phenomenon of queuing, space, queuing tape, slipstream modeling and drive-ins. I'll return to that, of course. After this discussion, I will shortly conclude and also point ahead for some further options in light of COVID-19. However, without further ado, let's get started. The COVID-19 pandemic has unleashed an unprecedented number of effects. The quantitative effects on health, economy, society, travel, social interaction, and almost any walk of life imaginable has been immense. There is no doubt that this is a deep crisis with profound effects. As we speak, ex estimations and extrapolations of what this means for the future of cities and society takes on new heights. working well? So, sorry. To establish an overview of the effects of COVID-19, it is not an easy task. There's a vast amount of uh, data to keep track of and innumerable sources to look into. Here we refer to sources found of value and credibility in order to build an overview. One that's quite early on in the global pa pandemic uh, became elevated as a credible source of information was the John Hopkins University um, in the USA. The same goes for the United Nations surveillance of the global spread of COVID-19, as well as the data provided by MIT. In Denmark, uh, the he Danish Health Authority and particularly State and Seum Institute uh, have been important sources of information and data to understand the spread and extension of COVID-19. 
There's a little bit of a gap with this, okay. It's obvious that the pandemic effect of mo on uh, the pandemic affected mobilities across a mode of scale all over the world. Just a few Danish statistics would suffice to prove this point. The national numbers of ferry, ferry passengers dropped with 17%, the number of railway passengers with 24%, the number of passengers in the Copenhagen Metro with 30% between the first quarter of 2019 and the first quarter of 2020. The number of passengers com in Copenhagen Airport fell with 64% when compared with March 2019 and March 2020, which was the month of the Danish lockdown. However, this paper is, more about, uh, is not about the big effects. Rather, we invite and to reflect upon the often taken for granted nature of mobilities in the contemporary city. We want to think with COVID-19, as it were, in order to utilize it as a catalyst for bringing about some more nuanced and deeper understandings and descriptions of banal everyday practices. For example, standing in line at the bus shed, the positioning and seating on the subway, the passing of pedestrians on the pavement, and the mobile negotiation of street spaces. The Mobility's Turn has for more than a decade provided us with new detailed and at times provocative insights into the meaning of moving and the cultures of mobilities. However, and this is the key claim of this presentation, with the COVID-19 event we are facing a deep and profound disruption that enables even more critical reflection. The paper wants to treat COVID-19 um, as, as a vehicle into what I want to call the politics of visibility. Ideas such as social distancing um, is one example that will be explored. From Hall, seminal studies in the 1950s um, and onward, we have known that different physical distances are practiced between social actors in different settings. Intimate social and public distances have long been part of um, the way in which we negotiate social interaction in private and public spaces. Much of the research on COVID-19 being conducted at this moment is devoted to the future prospects of life after corona. How will this pandemic disruption change our practices, cultures, and interaction norms for the future? The underlying idea or hypothesis, if you want, of this presentation is that the COVID-19 event is as much a window into the existing and ordinary practices as to the extraordinary and future ones. Sorry. It's running. Global disruption as effect of COVID-19 are serious in all their environmental, human and systemic economic effects. However, they also act as openings into the ways in which infrastructural systems and mobility technologies shape our uh, everyday lives. Disruptive events prompts rethinking the taking for granted. What seems to be different spatial scales, the big global versus the small body, is however connected and not fruitfully thought as separate. Global disruption touches local perception. This we learned when the air traffic corridor between North America and Europe was blocked with the eruption by the Atlantic volcano back in 2010. Here, 10 years later, and motivated by the virus and not volcanoes, the final comments from an analysis seem st still seems to carry some relevance. I want to quote this. Systems breakdown and vulnerabilities is one aspect. Another is the way global power geometries reflect inequalities and unevenness in the capacities to deal with mobility breakdown and alternatives from regions and nations to companies and individuals. The event, here the Icelandic volcano, also uncovered ways we engaged with thinking about the world as one place with profound repercussions to the notion of global consciousness or at least global awareness. And as already mentioned, the event sparked ways of engaging with emotion and effect. When we, we experience these huge events with far reaching consequences, speculations about futures may indeed emerge. Despite or perhaps because of the sophisticated infrastructures and global interaction patterns, humans do not control the globe. In the age of the Anthropocene, humanity is leaving a lasting implant, implant on the globe, yet it does not hold it in its power to control. In the light of COVID-19 and the global disruptions we furthermore see, very div divergent imar imaginaries and reactions, from cosmopolitan community recreation and visions of new beginnings, to destructive theories of conspiracy and nationalist protectionism. The Austrian artist and art curator, Peter Weibel, has contributed to the public debate about the post-COVID-19 society. In his analysis, one of the key problems is the culture of proximity. In a rather comprehensive critique of the global society, Weibel points at two key issues of relevance here. One is the demise of mass mobility, and the other is the end of the face-to-face -face society. Weibel argues that we are facing a long-distance society in which mediation by technologies would render co-presence, face-to-face interaction and mass mobility both superfluous and redundant. 
This prediction seems somewhat far-reaching. However, Weibel is pointing to some of the key issues that the advent of COVID-19 has brought forward. His analysis is launched from the point of view of media theory, and there is a certain media determination to it. Earlier scholars have noticed that social distance has been extended by communication technology as well, Hall, McLuhan, etc. On the other hand side, it is inevitable that physical proximity in the context of COVID-19 is a challenge. Weibel's prediction and the bold statement to avoid proximity with others and keep your distance to steer clear of infection, unquote, are tied into wider arguments against mass events such as games, football, um, matches, concerts, etc. Weibel provocatively announces these to be dead in the mediated long-distance society. The revenues from global viewer payment that vastly outnumber the revenues from co-present spectators seems to support this view. Weibel sees the existence of remote masses and virtual audiences as the evidence to these events have, that have become obsolete rituals of the face-to-face -face and interaction-based society. These spectacular forecasts might be too far-fetched for, far for some to stomach, but in the context of this presentation, it is interesting that Weibel contributes in engaging proximity, but also that it rethinks the notion of globalization as big and ho homogeneous processes. Bible's radical analysis touches the heart of human interaction, and in all fairness, he also advocates a more profound critique of the way in which we conduct food production, global transport, and mass communication consumption from the point of view of environmental concern and critique of social inequality. Here, however, we mainly wanted to include his analysis since it's so closely tied to the points already um, related to co-presence and proximity, very central themes to, the themes to this presentation. Across or beyond the simple global local scale perception, Bruno Latour has said in relation to COVID-19 that the viruses are completely inside us and that we must learn to live with them. The presence of COVID-19 is, for Latour, a reminder of the importance of other participants in our ways of life, such as microbes and viruses. Accordingly, Latour sees COVID-19 as a giant experiment for, that humanity faces with a view to a somewhat steep learning curve. curve. On a more positive note, Latour sees an increased public awareness of the complexity in scientific statements, as well as of the vulnerabilities that has become evident in the light of COVID-19. So I want to propose two concepts for rethinking um, interaction in the light of this. And one concept is the notion of extended bodies. And it's related to our multisensorial engagement with the world. From earlier mobilities research, we've seen that we are related to the world in a much more complex way than simply subjects standing in and against an object world. The notion of osmosis was coined first by uh, uh, Malapontu and later uh, in my own work as a way to think about how we are open to the world via our multiple sensations. And this is a quote I want to read out. The enrollment of the human body into places create complex assemblages where materialities are not just external to humans but rather permeable, as it were, um, as it here will be ter termed as a deep relationship of osmosis. This is, for example, the case when flying a passenger aircraft with pressure cabin technology. Many will be familiar with the air pressure and the dry mouth resulting from this interface. It's an interface of osmosis where body-world relation is much more complex than subject-object dichotomy will allow for. Another example of osmosis is the way acceleration is felt deep in the body when we're driving a speeding car or cycling downhill feeling topographies with the corporeal and sensorial effects are also examples of how the body is permeable and open um, to uh, its, uh, its uh, surrounding environment. We might say that the boundaries of the self extends beyond the body, to quote Hall. Reynolds, another scholar working from the point of view of gerontology, argues and articulates the notion of extended body um, in a somewhat similar uh, way. So Reynolds argued that, quote, the extended body refers to the ways in which one's body always extends into the environment, just as the environment extends into it. For example, my ability to run five kilometer race depends on a host of natural and social conditions, from proper running gear to navigable path to a non-toxic non environment. It also depends on the condition of my upbringing and labor. What, what I was or not ex exposed to as a child, the types of demand, my economic situation places on my lungs and immune system. It, of course, also involved my particular body, circulation, central nervous system, functioning, joint, uh, ligament, muscular strength, flexibility, the presence, absence, or particular formation of lower limbs, and so forth. But the point is that my body is just one component, 
and my ability to run extends far beyond it. So the notion of extended body illustrates via the COVID-19 that there is something between us, such as sound, air, atmosphere, and many other things. Obviously, we've known this for a long time. Media theorist Marshall McLuhan spoke about the electric technology as a global extension of the human nervous system already, already in the 1960s. However, the awareness and anxiety about virus in the air is a window into the fact that we are related and connected beyond um, the Cartesian subject-object model. COVID-19 has become the proverbial parable for thinking through how we relate to public spaces, and the notion of the extended body, body will act as a hypothesis for this. Extended bodies in interaction is a way to illustrate air as commons. This means that the air and the local atmospheres around and between us are important shared and collective dimensions of everyday life mobility. With the extended body, we start to see how the air is becoming controversial as a three-dimensional and volumetric space around us. As urbanist Jan Giel once spoke of urbanism as life between the buildings, we are now exploring the space between our bodies. We are commoning the air between us, however, not necessarily with the result of peaceful consent. One reason why the commoning of the air between us has become troubled is the fact that it has become dangerous, or at least officially problematic. The Japanese public health campaigns have, for instance, warned citizens against the three Cs, closed spaces, crowded spaces, and closed contact situations. Mobile situations are marked by the space and place available, available for mobility um, and in co inhabitation. This means that density is a factor. And in the literature on, for example, pedestrian mobility, some scholars speak of pedestrian level of service, LOS, and make quite detailed quantitative measurement of what differences in pedestrian density means for the percep perception of the mobile situation. Quantitative data as evidence for how much space between human, human bodies um, is available on the street is already quite um, a well-spread phenomen phenomenon in uh, quantitative um, research on pedestrianism. The extended body suggests that we are related with humans and non-humans in more complex systems than we often th seem to be, think to be the case. The volumetric dim dimension of mobile practices needs to be taken into account and the potential presence of virus in the air is affording these reflections and co conceptualizations. In tourism study, Martin Tranberg Jensen proposes attention giving to particles, their movements and impacts, with a perspective that he terms particography. This is the geography of particles including their movements and engagement with various bodies. Particography was discussed well before COVID-19, but the call for attention to small matters that move seems to be more pertinent after COVID-19 than ever. A parallel and somewhat similar standpoint on the relational connections between bodies and environments can be found in the so-called skin studies or the dermatological turn. Accordingly, we are related to the world via our interface of our bodies or what House terms the skinscape. This is not really working. There you go. Um, quote, we use the term skinscape to refer to the contiguity uh, or intimate association between the surface of our body and the surface of the earth or landscape as found in many non-Western cultures. In Aboriginal Australia, the landscape is a skinscape. It's composed on the material traces of the bodies or the ancestral beings who roamed and shaped the countryside. Equally, natives of Peru speaks of skin knowledge as a way to articulate the localized wayfinding competences. Another proponent of skin studies, Marc Lafrance, comes rather close to the idea of osmosis when stating that, quote, far from sealed off or seamless membrane, the skin is full of folds, pores, and orifices that push it into the world and the world into it. This furthermore, furthermore echoes Geo Simmel's point from his Esso Sociology of the Senses, in which he describes how modern man, sick, has become short-sensed. By this, Simmel referred to the situation in which humans within the urban masses um, are being stimulated in such a way that the short senses, smell, tactility, etc., increasingly matters. And in relation to smell, Simmel remarked that when we smell another person, it is a very intimate sensation in which this person penetrates into our most inner senses in air form. In other words, our osmotic openness to the world and including other bodies, is best described as a relation beyond subject and object. The design thinker and practitioner Robert Sommer, who designed everything from interior air airplane cabins to public spaces, speaks of the, quote, emotionally charged zone around the body, and, we, and that we all carry a portable territory. Hence, 
both a dimension of territoriality and belonging, as well as a mobile, sensorial, and effectual relation. With reference to Cheryl Hammonson's skin study related to handshakes and pandemics, Le France illustrates the usefulness of skin study to COVID-19 in a manner that he could not possibly have foreseen. He argues, quote, Hamilton is interested in how the handshake has become the site of both concern and contestation in biopolitical context, characterized by the con constant awareness of and threat from global viral pandemic. In these contexts, the skin is staged as a contaminated and contam con contaminable, while the hands, particularly the palms, are presumed to be dirty and dangerous. As a result, the end of game handshake has fallen out of favor in some of its cases being represented uh, replaced by other distance and distancing gestures, such as hi and whatever. These works were written well before the breakout of COVID-19, but it resonates precisely with the discussion of bodily interaction and tactility. The handshake that in some cultures has become the way of establishing trust have now become a direct uh, source of distrust and suspicion. The role of effect and emotion in relation to the extended body space relation require a non-representational and poetic approach. One example of the latter is the work of the thinker and artist duo Manning and Masumi, as here in an account of an urban rush hour experience. You're late. You're hurrying from the subway to the office in a crowded rush hour sidewalk. Bodies all around, thick and thinner, fast and slower, in a complex ebb and flow. In the ebb and flow, temporary openings come and go. Your perception is focused on the coming and going of openings, which corresponds to no thing in particular. Each opening is a field of effect. It is an artifact of the moving configuration of the bodies around you, factoring the relative speeds and the rates of acceleration and deceleration as their paths weave around each other and around obstacles. The opening is not simply a hole, a lack of something occupying it. It is a positive expression of how everything in the field, moving and still integrally relates at that instant. You are suffering the crowd, even as the crowd is suffering you. Despite the rush, this is not without joy. You revel in the fluidity of your trajectory without focusing on it as a feeling tone separate from the movement. You have performed an integral distance of attention, seemingly without thinking, but you were thinking with your movement. Your activity was your thinking. Now let me conclude this section on the extended body with the American pragmatist Robert Schusterman and his call for a situated and self-aware sense of body space conceptualization. Schusterman argues that to focus on feeling one's body is to fo foreground it against an environmental background, which must be somehow felt in order to constitute the experiential background. One cannot feel oneself sitting or standing without feeling that part of the environment upon which one sits or stand. Nor can one feel oneself breathing without feeling the surrounding air we inhale. Such lessons of somatic self-consciousness eventually point forward to a vision of an essentially situated relational and symbolic self that rather than a traditional concept of an autonomous, self-grounded, individual, monadic, and indestructible and unchanging soul." Unquote. So, our bodies connect, relate, sense, and touch in various ways upon and mediated by different forms of materials, from air and particles to heart services and human-made artifacts. The notion of the extended body is one way of articulating this assemblage of body and context. Much more groundwork needs to be done for this to become a, theoret a coherent theoretical position. For now, it will suffice and we'll turn to the social rules and technologies embedded into these uh, extended bodies. In particular, I want to talk to you about the idea of the stretched or the elastic situation as a fruitful and relevant perspective uh, on social interaction in light of COVID-19. The concept of the elastic situation is based on an already articulated idea of connectivity pro proximity. This idea that connection and prox proximity is somewhat, somehow related. The idea is that the situation stretches out, as it were, via technology, infrastructure, and all other artifacts. Face-to-face -face interaction is relying on body language and gest gestures, visual and audio communication of spoken languages. The distance where we meaningful can speak of, of a situation has changed dramatically with the advent of, di of digital communication technology. The mediation and extension of the situation is now even more exposed as we are forced to address social distance by explicit, explicit media measures. Mostly we have an unconscious and culturally embedded sense of standing too close to someone. The calculative and governmental articulation of safe social distances makes visible the fact that we already have norms and codes for this in the everyday life. The subtle, subtle, subtle calibrations of proper interactional distances are being exposed 
in the intervention and safety protocols related to COVID-19. Looking at these from the point of view of the elastic situation, renders the authorities' policies more than simply governmental pro procedures. They become experiments of the situational dynamics. The focus on mobile situation and situators practices is the, situational, is the theoretical background for this presentation. This means that mobile situations are seen as containing three analytical dimensions, material space, social interaction and embodiment. Spoken differently, mobile situations take place in physical settings, often as social interaction and always as embodied practice. From earlier research has been shown that mobile situations are mediated and that infrastructure and technologies increasingly enact the relation between closeness or proximity and connectivity. The so-called proximity-connectivity nexus suggests that mobile situations are configured as an effect of how proximity and connectivity is mediated. For example, in the barter economy, trading a pick for some flour would require physical co-presence of both parties in the transaction. As things have developed today, the infrastructure and the, and the mediated, mediatized platforms sustaining the economy enables action at a distance, and hence that we can buy and sell in the market um, without actually being physically present. The nexus between proximity and connectivity has been altered, and this means that the situation stretches, and hence that we can buy and sell without being present, and we stretch the situation across time and space. How many times have you not witnessed the start of a mobile conversation sounding something like this, Hi, it's me, I'm on the bus, or the train, or the plane, or whatever. The point is that the situation are stretched across time and space because we carry networks. This accounts for the proximity connectivity nexus has a technological bias in, as it, as, since we also find situations where we have stretched elasticity without any presence of technology. This is, for example, the case when parents try to keep small children close to them by calling them. The situation stretches and depends on the hearing of the call as well as the intention to follow the call. The Canadian sociology urban government illustrates the elasticity of the situation with the notion of the knot line. When conducted his fieldwork in the Shetland Islands during his work on his PhD thesis in the early 1950s, he noticed that people moving towards one another from afar inevitable, inevitable would get close, um, so close that they would approach what, I, what he called the knot line. Passing this without nodding would be a cons considered a social offence and a rude behaviour, hence the elasticity of the situations. In the other words, the ways in which mobile situations are held together connects to the stretchiness and elasticity of the communication mediation taking place. Coming back to COVID-19, this becomes important since one of the key regulatory inventions is the distance between bodies. Nevertheless, this is some um, this is somewhat wrongly termed social distance, but actually we're dealing with physical distance. Nevertheless, all over the world, social distance is now measured in centimeters and meters. However, the explicit measurement of re and regulations of one or one and a half or two meters as the permitted distance between bodies in space precisely makes the already existing norms and cultures of proper distances more visible. The distances within is, however, not a, a new phenomenon. Already the American ethnographer Edward Hall noticed what he termed, termed the distances in man. In his seminal book, The Hidden Dimension from 1966, Hall speaks about how animal appropri animals appropriate territories and inhabit them with some dimension of distance culture. Hall terms research into these matters for proxemics, and he does acknowledge that individuals use the physical distance between bodies to understand the situation, a similar conclusion reached by Goffman. Hall is also aware of density and draws some rather problematic conclusions related to the so-called overcrowding in at what that time was called ghettos. Terms such as the behavioral sink um, and comparisons with studies of rats in overcrowded environments are problematic by present-day ethical standards. However, Hall identifies a set of distances that, were still, that still carry relevance today. He speaks of intimates, intimate, zero to one and a half feet, personal, one and a half to four feet, social, four to ten feet, and public distances, ten feet and upwards. Reading these on the background of COVID-19 is more than just an interesting thing, and one might wonder why we speak of social distance as something new. The date of Hall's research and the fact that an old anthropology book might not be so well known is probably an explanation to why this knowledge seems to be overlooked in the contemporary COVID-19 de debate. Coming from Hall and the situational perspective of mobile situations, we notice that situations are complex and dynamic. They may indeed stretch across space and hence expose some level of elasticity. Now, they are, as already said, also embodied, and the way in which we relate to others in the environment is heavily mediated um, by the body with its multiple senses and capacities. 
In the section on embodiment, we saw that the relationship is one of osmosis and openness. This was partly captured by the attention given to the way in which body themselves extends into spaces and situations. Moreover, it's also a relationship that is affected by the volumes of air and the local atmosphere in the spaces we inhabit. In the street space, the volumes of voids are engaging shapes um, we are engaging shape our sensation and interpretation of the situation. Microclimatic conditions of shade, wind, sun, draft or shelter can only be understood if we include the so-called volumetric dimension of the mobile situation. Hence, the three-dimensionality of multisensorial engagement with the materiality of mobile situations is significant and suggests another layer of complexity um, next to the interactional distances already present in our everyday life discussion. In examples to follow shortly, I will address the volumes with the case of running in the slipstream and the interactional distance made by queuing tape. However, it's important to notice that the disputes and regulations dealing with speed, distance and density in public space under COVID-19 imply a play on already existing norms and cultures. The interesting thing about COVID-19 and the regulatory acts of it, from the point of view of situational mobilities, is that they make visible the silent codes and practices. In that sense, COVID-19 becomes a window into the existing cultures and normativity related to how close and how dense we want to be in public spaces. So, from this framing, we will now move towards specific examples of transformed social dynamics as effects of COVID-19. We propose three short vignettes as examples of this large um, and hard to overview global uh, COVID-19 phenomenon. The three short vignettes concern queuing tape, slipstream, modeling and drive-ins. So let me explore in uh, short illustrations how to make sense of these, neutralizing the notion of the extended body and the elastic situation. This is a photo from my local shop, Bosen, where I live. Um, the first example is queuing tape, as we see it in supermarkets, shops and spaces of lineups. The way in which the new distance of norms of two meters, some places only one and a half meter and now one meter in Denmark, testifies to the re relative governmentality vested into these measures are being scripted into the shop interior. In in, um, and it's interesting since it connects to the already existing codes and values that formally and informally govern our queuing practices. Here we want to suggest that the practice of inserting queuing tape visualizes and articulizes existing scripts for standing in line, or what I prefer to call queuing culture. By this is meant the formal and informal norms governing and regulating practices of standing in line. These are mostly a mix of global generic scripts and local situated practices. By inserting queuing tape, the existing norms for waiting in line become circumscribed into a politics of visibility. What is clear from the image is that the distance enforced between queuing customer in this shop is now formally protocoled. Just stopping at the tape, ensuring that one is not too close to the next customer, is such an unusual act that it prompts reflection on what you normally do. The ordinary queuing experience, i.e. before COVID-19, is not formally prescribed and measured out. Hence, the mere fact of tape on the floor opens up a space of reflection related both to exceptional and unusual as well as to the ordinary. As you, as you stand in line, you might start wondering, do I normally stand this far from people? What is actually the normal distance? How does it feel if someone standing too close to me? How do I detect and establish if this is the fact? These and surely many other questions and reflections are actu actu actualized by the presence of the distance marking tape on the floor. It's hardly the case that queuing customers under the spell of COVID-19 will analyze the situation using terms like the extended body and elastic situations. However, we are able to interpret the waiting line under the guise of COVID-19 with these concepts. The queuing tape vignette illustrates that personal space and portable territorial sense of self versus a world in quite a direct manner. The informal and culturally coded prescriptions where of where to stand and how to position oneself in the queue that normally are seen as tacit and unspoken frame conditions are now brought into the open. So is the fact that the situation is elastic, but also that there is a limit to this. If you are too close, if you're too far from the counter, you cannot pay unless you stretch the payment situation via the touchless app system that is now available. The second example that I want to discuss are the computer-based models of runners and cyclists and how their breeding may create slipstreams of contagious COVID-19 virus. The background is that these types of softwares were developed to increase the capacity of top athletes when cycling and running. By estimating how the turbulence of the slipstream behaved in computer simulations, 
athletes could in, be instructed to place themselves in the best possible position, gaining aerodynamic advantages. The public controversy of the slipstream is another example of the politics of visibility, throwing light at the volumetric aero environment surrounding us in our daily movements in the city, as well as it's a testament to the lack of consensual commoning of our portable territories. And those of you who are from Copenhagen will notice that this was a case down the lakes, certainly where people are discussing about how close you can actually run to others. And that was after these uh, diagrams or these computer models um, uh, made by uh, Dutch uh, scientists. In a computer simulation studies, Bloch and, and colleagues demonstrate that the way in which the micro droplets potentially containing COVID-19 distribute is very different between running and walking bodies. From their study, they conclude that the results indicate that the largest exposure of the trailing person to droplets for walking and running is obtained when this person is in line and with a leading person and positioned in the slipstream of this leading person. Exposure increases as the distance between leading and trailing person decreases. decreases. This suggests that avoiding substantial droplet exposure in the condition of the study can be achieved by one of two actions. Either by avoiding to walk or run in the slipstream of the leading perso person or by keeping larger social distances where the distance is increased with a walking or running speed. The equivalent social distance for walking and running in the slipstream is defined as the distance that should be kept between the leading and trailing walker runner to avoid substantial exposure to slipstream droplets, similar to the case where two people are standing still at a 1.5 meter distance. In the absence of headwind, tailwind or crosswind, for walking fast at 4 km an hour, this distance is about 5 meters. And for running 14.4 km an hour, this distance is about 10 meters. So you can start taking that down to the legs and see how people actually did not uh, carry on a 10 meter distance. Here the point is rather that these results and similar types of scientific evidence started to feed into the public media and social media, leading to a heated debate and sometimes social media shaming. This suggests a challenge to commenting the air between us and calls indeed for sociological analysis. In the context of this presentation, the more interesting dimension is that the debate about the running in the slipstream or even staying in the slipstream is another case of making the invisible relations visible. Obviously, it has always been the case that there are micro droplets coming from human bodies, as well as these may affect one another in the case of dense co-presence. However, with the advent of COVID-19 and these following research results that has visualized the extended bodies and the air between us in ways that has not been discussed in public before. However, because of the epidemic disruptive context of these controversial discoveries and visualizations, the results are state and statements are not just being taken as cool facts at face value. To speak with Latour, we might say that matters of fact indeed have become matters of concern. The scientific results feed into a heated debate about commoning the air between us and the right to be present in public spaces. As presented elsewhere, before COVID-19, the public norm for social distance had to do with proper behavior, blasé attitudes and urban civility. After COVID-19, these have become social and health-oriented proverbial battlefields where transgression leads to condemnation or so, uh, as social is irresponsible behavior. The vineyard of the slipstream running is an illustration of the physical and material conditions that define the extended bodies and the distances proposed by this research in order to safeguard people from infection illustrate how situations like running together or passing by is an effect of the elasticity of the situation. So let me get to the final example of the drive-in. The third and final example is the increasing utilization of cars in drive-in events. In this presentation, I want to focus in on a church service as an illustration of how to rethink interaction patterns mediated through the car. In the early days of the COVID-19 crisis in the US, we started seeing reports about drive-in um, or drive-through corona test facilities being set up. Not long hereafter, Danish hospitals followed suit with drive-in test facilities. I've been tested in one myself in the summer holiday. It's quite interesting. Drive-in church services are now the latest twist on this automobilization of COVID-19 to be reported in Danish media. <coughs> Excuse me. The vignette reports a story from the Danish newspaper Politiken about a drive-in church service held on Palm Sunday in April 2020 in Valby, a suburban neighborhood to Copenhagen. The newspaper report of the event on social media reads, and this is my translation, honk, honk, honk. Churches all over the country have been closed down for services as long as Denmark is closed down. They have found a solution to this in Valby. Drive in church service. You stay in your car while you listen to the preaching and you can sing along with the Psalms. 
At face value, this might seem to be the case of the so-called cocooning by the car. In the literature, the car has been dubbed the iron cage, and often we see arguments related to the car as insulated from its context. Surely this is part of the motivation of car-based COVID-19 test facilities and driving uh, events. However, a more nuanced view of this is to see the car as a filtering and mediating device between the eye and the world. Thinking about driving through COVID-19 city, there is an element of cocooning related to the car. The case of the drive, Danish driving church ser uh, service seems to support this. What was taking place in Copenhagen was, in some respect, a case utilizing the car's shield against the real and imagined COVID-19 virus threat by your neighboring worshipper. As the vicar of the local church lamented the lack of co-present wor worshipping, he realized that the solution was exactly the car as it shielded off members of the congregation sufficiently to be able to do service. From the newspaper account, we learned that it was only permitted to have left side car window open and that cars had to be parked with sufficient distance between them, in this case two meters. There were, however, actual accounts of uh, exceptions, as for instance a woman waving her hand through the sunroof or two girls watching the service with an open back door of the car, a hunchback model of, co uh, model of car that is. So, how to make sense of this? Obviously, this is another case of car-based stratification and even exclusion. How can you attend drive-in church services if you don't have access to a car? Thus, this dimension inscribes itself into a long line of other forms of exclusion by the car as the drive-in corona test facility also suggests. However, here I want to return to the filtering versus cocoon discussion. At first glance, the practices of organizing drive-in church services seems to be, yes, the car is a cocoon. This is precisely why the service is doable without violating the corona security, corona security enforcement rules. However, if you start looking more closely, this service would not make sense if the car were truly a cocoon, let alone an iron cage. The visual engagement with the vicar and the band mediated with a large TV screen and AV audio systems would not make sense if the service could not be seen or heard. The waving of hands out of car windows and the honking of horns and clear elements are clear elements of an inter interactional reciprocity and two-way communication. Something that is impossible if you are sealed off and isolated from the world. The news reporter also noticed that the vicar shouts out, hey, can we dance a bit? And car drivers start honking horns and rocking from side to side in the cars creating a technologically mediated and admittedly slightly more slow dance than you would normally see. The cars turned into a movable envelope that registered body movements, even with some friction compared to the effortless dance that would have been the situation had the congregation met at its ordinary, ordinary Sunday church. So, in relation to the vignettes related to queuing tape and slipstream running, the drive-in story is different. Here we're dealing with the technology mediating, mediation the car. Nevertheless, this is a relevant case of situational mobilities, partly because mobil mo automobility the automobile must be recognized as one of the most dominating forces uh, that has reshaped post-war urbanism. Moreover, we tend to think of ourselves as isolated from the world when driving a car. The little dance story of the Dan Danish vicar seems to suggest that even within the steel frame of a car, we are related to the world. The body is surely stretched by cars, but our capacities to act at a distance, e.g. horns and flashing lights, within the elastic situation is present as well within this vignette. Many other exams could have been engaged, but these three, queuing tapes, slipstream modeling and drive-ins, are sufficient to illustrate that we are not only dealing with a massive and aggregated disruption, we may document with loads of statistics. These quantitative transformations are surely taking place. However, so are myriads of small qualitative changes. The three vignettes here, the notion of the extended body and the elastic situation, enables us to illustrate how epidemic disruption alters mobilities in the wake of COVID-19. There are undoubtedly many lessons to draw from COVID-19. In this presentation, the grand narrative of global epidemic disruption has deliberately been put in the background. They are surely important, but the reg regulatory frameworks and governance practices targeting the detailed everyday life mobilities are also worth, worth pondering on. The presentation has tried to use COVID-19 intervention in relation to physical distance as a background to a discussion about how to conceptualize and theorize these distances in the first place. The disruptive event has in a way exaggerated the awareness to distance between bodies in public space, and hence enabled us to rethink or even think with COVID-19. From existing research into mobile situations, we found useful ideas of bodies and situations that has led to the coining of the terms extended body and elastic situations. Queuing tape, slipstream running and drive-ins are all related to social practices and codes of behavior that due to COVID-19 now stand in an altogether different light. To point ahead, we might 
envision an empirical research looking deeper into extended bodies and elastic situations. Moreover, this work might lead to the coining of other theoretical concepts such as portable ambience or body auras. By portable ambience, I mean taking point of departure in understanding of atmosphere as both a very material phenomenon of particles and turbulence and moving air, as well as a socially coded and effectual phenomenon. The atmospheric COVID-19 readings in this paper suggest precisely that the material and cultural dimension of atmosphere hybridizes. In light hereof, we might say that we are carrying ambience and not entering into atmosphere, as it were. The other concept, that of body aura, is thus an attempt to articulate that the space around our bodies are full of aerial flows and microscopic materials, but they are also vested with symbolic meanings and cultural norms. A notion such as body aura might be a working hypothesis with the aim of bringing health science, engineering knowledge and social science knowledge together, seeing the body and its immediate surroundings as an assemblage of material and immaterial elements. The COVID-19 event is surely not over this, when this paper and presentation is done and published, and, all, and the world will in all likelihood face many other future challenges which require social intervention. There are practical challenges that responsible societies need to respond to immediately whenever epidemic disruption occurs. However, there are also needs to reflect and rethink in relation to the dimension of our lives that we take for granted or even hardly notice. This is why dramatic events like COVID-19 is not only require instant reaction, but also opens up for reflection and analysis of existing conditions. In this presentation, I tried to show this for the question of distance between bodies and public space. COVID-19 has furthermore provoked our understanding of fixed spatial scales. Yes, indeed, it is a global phenomenon but at the same time, it touches the geography closest in. As COVID-19 is in the body and transported by the body, it makes no sense to separate this very local level from the global. On this note, we want to, I want to end with a, with a word from the Italian physicist Paolo Giorgiani, Giordano, uh, who in his best-selling book, How Contag Contagion Works, vividly commented and reflected upon COVID-19. And in this, he says at the very end, the personal and global is intertwined in ways that are so mysterious that we become exhausted even before we as much as try to think it through. Contagion is an encouragement to think. The time of the quarantine is the opportunity to do so. Think about what? That we are not just part of the human community. We are the most intrusive species in a fragile and unique ecosystem. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, very much. That was a journey into a conceptual depth and theoretical depth and understanding of COVID-19 that I think very few of us have been exposed to for the last few months where the headlines have been panics or conflicts or test results and the dire news of what has happened globally. And I think this put a very, very nice perspective on the humbleness of what is actually being, what human beings are, what we are. But I also think when you finished and you said the personal and global are intertwined, mm -hmm. um, that left me thinking that we always think beyond ourselves, but sometimes we forget to bring ourselves into the beyond. Mm. And I think that, uh, that you, you really put the emphasis on that, the iron cage of the car that all of a sudden became an instrument of freedom, of movement in a situation where we've been stuck at home. I have been curating uh, the chat and as it's transparent, I've not received any questions, but I'd like to say goodbye to those of you who have stuck with us uh, throughout the last hour of Ole's uh, journey into the pandemic from a social phenomenon and uh, we'll wish you a very good day. <laughs> and then we'll take the session We'll continue here at Blocks Up and we'll look forward to seeing you the next time. So thank you and bye for now. Can we open the
And basically, 